Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. India lays out serious challenge from Pakistan at UNSC. Pashtuns seek world's attention to say their untold sufferings. And UN asks Afghan staff to stay home until May after female worker ban. Let's begin the show. A new dimension of terror that India is facing because of Pakistan, drones flying in dump everything from weaponry to narcotics to counterfeit currency. Recently, in a whale attack on Pakistan at the United Nations Security Council's open debate, India called on the international community to condemn cross-border illicit supply of weapons. Here's a report. India continues its strong and focused commitment to help UN member states build capacity to prevent and counter terrorism. Along with huge monetary contributions in the fight against terrorism, New Delhi is always very vocal about this global threat. Recently, in a veiled attack on Pakistan at the United Nations Security Council's open debate, India called on the international community to condemn cross-border illicit supply of weapons. Speaking at the UN Security Council, India's permanent representative to the UN, Ruchira Kamboj, emphasized that India was facing a serious challenge of cross-border supply of illicit weapons by means of drones. The illicit transfer and illegal diversion of arms, including conventional arms and ammunition, small arms and light weapons, as well as weapons of mass destruction, their delivery systems and related materials, equipment and technology to non-state actors, including armed and terrorist groups, pose serious threats to international peace and security. The rise in volume and quantity of the small arms acquired by terrorist organizations remind us time and time again that they cannot exist without the sponsorship or support of states. In our context, we are facing a serious challenge of cross-border supply of illicit weapons using drones, which cannot be possible without active support from the authorities in control of those territories. The international community should condemn such behavior and hold such states accountable for their misdeeds. Indian officials have reported drones coming in from Pakistan to drop weapons and drugs for terrorists in Punjab, Jammu and Kashmir and Rajasthan. Last year till November, at least 22 such drones were reported captured by Indian agencies and 266 drone infiltrations were reported during the year. On March 24th, BSF personnel recovered five Austria-made Glock pistols and more than 90 rounds of various caliber bullets along the international border in Punjab. The same day, another large cache of arms was discovered in a packet near the international border. On March 11th, BSF personnel recovered a 3-kilogram bag of heroin in Amritsar. On the 10th, the BSF recovered arms, ammunition and contraband items in Punjab's Gurdaspur. Aryan Boy drones made in China and used by Pakistan transport everything from assault rifles and pistols to military-grade explosive RDX IEDs such as stiffen bombs, drugs and counterfeit currency. Participating in the Council session on threats and risks to international security from the illicit export of weapons, Cambodge also warned about the collusion between terrorists and certain countries that arm them. Quantum of these threats multiplies when certain states with dubious proliferation credentials in view of their masked proliferation networks and deceptive procurement practices of sensitive goods and technologies collude with terrorists and other non-state actors. Frequent park drone incursions are seen as systematic out of frustration arising of terrorist infiltration drastically pulled down. Besides that, they imply lower cost and fewer terrorist lives in danger. Security analysts are concerned that this will be India's most difficult challenge on the Western Front in the future.
Ordinary Pashtun civilians have been facing innumerable miseries because of Pakistan's so-called war on terror. Pashtun civilians are deliberately mislabeled, harassed and used as a political tool by Islamabad in order for the country to earn international praise for supposedly combating terrorism. Let's take a closer look at the Pashtun community in Pakistan and Pakistan's targeting of this group under the guise of combating terror. On December 16, 2014, a terrorist attack on the army public school in Pakistan's Peshawar city shook the world's conscience. This attack was one of the world's deadliest school massacres. Seven gunmen affiliated with the tehreek e taliban Pakistan killed 149 people, including 132 school children. In retaliation, Pakistan established the National Action Plan to crack down on terrorism. A joint military offensive called Operation zarb azad was launched and subsequently augmented by Pakistan Armed Forces in the Pashtun-dominated North Waziristan. The operation was primarily aimed at wiping out the Tehreeki Taliban Pakistan and other terrorist organizations. Pakistan's so-called War on Terror in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and other Pashtun-dominated areas displaced over a million civilians. A large number of individuals, including women and children, were forcefully kidnapped, tortured, and extrajudicially killed by security agencies in those areas. The Taliban also intensified its attacks in the region, resulting in the loss of life and property. The conflict gave birth to the Pashtun Tahfuz movement, a social movement founded in May of 2014 by students for Pashtun human rights. Pashtun Tahfuz movement, PTM, which claims to be an unarmed and peaceful resistance movement, has faced strong opposition by the Pakistan government and its security agencies. The Pakistani government has accused the group of dividing Pakistanis on the basis of ethnicity and of following a foreign agenda. The movement has received support in neighboring Afghanistan, where a large number of Pashtuns have joined the cause. With all the attacks that the TTP is planning and has already conducted, the only viable solution right now has been that Pashtuns have come out on the streets, they protested vigorously, they've said no to the presence of Taliban. Without the presence of PTM, you would have had a huge wave of terrorist attacks along the Duran line. And they have prevented them. So you see that they have become a buffer between communities, between people, normal people, and the terrorist attacks. The PTM, led by Manzoor Pashtin, is holding frequent rallies in Pakistan and other parts of the world to seek justice for Pashtuns. At the United Nations Human Rights Council, PTM activists are seeking international intervention to protect the rights of Pashtuns, especially the victims of terror and those facing atrocities committed at the hands of Pakistani security forces. Our basic demand was uh, peace, uh, peace and uh, right to life. That are the co uh, the main demand of Pashtun Tafuz movement. We want peace. Our area. We want peace in our area. Uh, we are against war. We are against any sort of uh, terrorism uh, because uh, we've been shown uh, by the Pakistani state agencies like uh, uh, facilitators uh, or sponsors of the terrorists. Uh, rather, we are uh, actually we are the the, the uh, victims of terrorism. The Pashtuns living in northwest Pakistan are facing persecution at the hands of both state and non-state actors. A 2022 report by NATO Defense Education Enhancement Program, DEEP, titled Narco Insecurity Inc. The Convergence of Pakistan and Afghanistan Narco Trade, has exposed the nexus between Pakistan spy agencies and the Taliban to carry out narcotics trafficking to fund their operations. As Pashtuns in the region suffer human rights abuses, Pakistani security forces and the Taliban are enjoying a bond in the backdrop of a clean chit given to Pakistan by the Financial Action Task Force. 
Innocent civilian Pashtuns have for decades suffered human rights abuses and atrocities committed by Pakistani security forces as well as the Taliban. As the PTM grows and raises awareness about the extrajudicial killings and enforced disappearances, the world will no longer be able to turn a blind eye. Pashtuns will continue to be empowered and demand their fundamental rights, exposing Pakistan, its army, and security agencies for the crimes they commit. Moving on. Security forces have now set out a number of operations to dismantle the network of park back terrorism in India's Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir. Islamabad is making desperate attempts to launch infiltration bits in the region. However, Indian Army, with the help of Jammu and Kashmir police, is putting an end to these terrorists with a commitment to upholding peace and tranquility in the area. Recently, Indian security forces foiled a major infiltration bit of three narco terrorists on the line of control in Jammu and Kashmir's Poonch district. A report. Jammu and Kashmir has remained at the target of Pakistan's state sponsored terrorism for decades, be it deadly terror attacks, cross border infiltration, or indulging into narco terrorism. Islamabad has not differed itself from indulging into anti Indian activities. Recently, Indian security forces foiled a major infiltration bid of three narco terrorists on the line of control in Jammu and Kashmir's Poonch district. Indian Army neutralized one terrorist while two others were captured alive with 17 kilograms of narcotics. According to police officials, around 10.15 p.m. on April 8th, troops deployed along the LOC in Poonch sector observed a suspicious movement of a group of three individuals close to the LOC. During preliminary questioning, the two narco-terrorists who had been apprehended alive claimed that all three of them were residents of Maidan Mohalla Chanjal POK. Pakistan having failed miserably in its proxy war through terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir has recently launched another form of hybrid terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir and that is through the sale of drugs. This is called as narco terrorism. However, it is not a major cause of worry for the Indian government as the government of India has taken adequate steps to control this kind of proxy war. It is a matter of time before this evil design too of Pakistan shall be defeated. The narco terror module operated by the infiltrators was being used to pump drugs into Jammu and Kashmir and fund terrorism in the region. However, the security forces have been able to derail the majority of these plots by apprehending or neutralizing narco-terror operatives. The overground workers on the Indian side of the LOC are facilitating further transportation of weapons and narcotics and many of them have been caught by the police. The security forces have been maintaining a high alert along the LOC in the twin border districts of Rajori and Punch to thwart infiltration attempts by terrorists and narco-terror operatives and most of these attempts have been successfully foiled. Rajori and Punch regions have been used as smuggling routes due to their proximity to the line of control with Pakistan. These areas have rugged terrain and dense forests, which makes it easier for smugglers to move undetected. However, law enforcement agencies have been taking measures to crack down on smuggling activities in these regions and prevent the illegal movement of goods and people across the border. To put an end to Pakistan's narco-terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir, the Indian government should take three measures. Firstly, there should be fast-track courts to try the people who have been caught in this act. Secondly, the youth of Jammu and Kashmir should be educated about the ills of narcotics to articles in the print media and programs in the electronic media and the social media. And thirdly, the government of India should raise this issue in every possible international forum. Islamabad's decades-long obsession with Kashmir has led to deprivation of food and development in the country. 
but despite its internal instability, failing economy and international isolation, the country does not compromise when it comes to funding terrorists. Let's shift our focus to Afghanistan, where the Taliban's tight limitations have crapped the nation. The hardliners have deprived millions of Afghan women of their right to education, ousted tens of thousands of women from jobs, and banned women businesses and all sorts of activism. They have trampled on Afghan women today and forced them back into the dark ages. Last week, Taliban banned Afghan women employees of the United Nations from working throughout the country. In response to the decision, UN Mission to Afghanistan launched a review of its operations and asked all Afghan staff, men and women, to not report to work until May 5th. A report. Women in Afghanistan are reeling under one of the worst phases in their lives. Since the Taliban group seized power in Afghanistan, the group have imposed a slew of restrictions including banning women from universities and public spaces. Last week, the group issued an order to ban Afghan women employees of the United Nations from working throughout the country. In response to the decision, United Nations has asked some 3,000 staff men and women to stay at home until May 5th, while it made necessary consultations, made any required adjustments to its operations and accelerated contingency planning. We have a responsibility to our staff to keep them safe, right? I think it would be irresponsible for a UN manager to tell uh, its female staff to say, you must go to work, you must report to, to the office, you must go out in the field, knowing very well it puts them at risk of arrest or detention. So the, the decisions taken are about staff safety, which is, which is primordial. Um, it does not mean that we are following or respecting uh, or accepting uh, the decisions that have been made. We are trying to find a solution moving forward, how we can do our work within our principles, respecting the Charter, respecting human rights, um, and also keeping staff, uh, staff safe. The restriction on female UN employees follows a December ban on most female NGO workers which drew widespread international condemnation. Some officials have expressed fear that donors may withdraw assistance for Afghanistan's largest humanitarian relief program and that delivering some programs and reaching women in the conservative country would be impossible without female employees. Initially, the limits did not apply to the United Nations and several other international organizations. However, in January, UN Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed flagged concerns that authorities could next restrict Afghan women working at international organizations. A ban on Afghan female UN workers could pose major challenges to the continued UN operations in Afghanistan. The founding UN Charter states that no restrictions be placed on the eligibility of men and women to work for the UN. This is putting us in, in a horrendous situation and, and putting, frankly, the Afghan people in a horrendous situation because we have principles that we have to abide to, humanitarian principles on non-discrimination. Um, we also have to abide by the, 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 the de facto authorities themselves, also have to abide by the charter in terms of letting us uh, do our work. But we also have to help the millions and millions of Afghans um, you know, almost 24 million Afghans need humanitarian assistance. So we are going to take this time to look at our programs, talk to the donors, continue the dialogue with the de facto authorities, and see how we can plan for the long term. Because we cannot, this is, you know, this is no way to run a railroad, in a, to, to put it very glibly. Uh, policies uh, are being announced, discriminatory policies. Um, and we have to find a way to continue helping 
the Afghan people, especially the women and girls, while not violating our own humanitarian principles. The recent Taliban ban on women working in international and national organizations and women moving about public spaces has also affected women being able to find employment. If less educated, they had a range of formal and informal jobs including working as housemates, baking bread, washing clothes, cleaning bathrooms and babysitting and in rural communities, rearing small livestock and growing wheat, maize and vegetables. Single women and widows have practically no way of earning money. On the ground reports reveal that many households are supported by women as male members of their family were either killed or injured in the ongoing conflict. It's difficult to estimate how long local communities, themselves struggling to survive, can keep women-led households and their families alive. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.